Thank you very, very much, Harold. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, and I can tell you in the Office of Pest Management Policy, we deal with a lot of issues that are just loads of fun. But it's a great pleasure, such great pleasure, to be able to work on behalf of our stakeholders and do what we can to make sure we have a good and safe agricultural production system. It's my pleasure today to open this conference with, by the, being able to introduce um, one of the people I had the uh, pleasure of working for last summer, uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine Wotecki. Dr. Wotecki is the Undersecretary for USDA's Research, Education, and Economics uh, mission area. She is also the Chief Scientist for USDA. Before joining USDA, Dr. Wotecki served as Global Director for Scientific Affairs for Mars uh, Incorporated, and I assure you um, that would be one of my favorite companies, um, <laughs> where she managed the company's scientific policy and research on matters of health, nutrition, and food safety. Um, um, uh, from 2002 to 2005, she was the Dean of Agriculture and Professor, professor of Human Nutrition uh, uh, at Iowa State University. Dr. Wotecki also served as the, um, the first undersecretary for food safety at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where she oversaw the U.S. government's food safety policy uh, and the USDA's continuity of operations planning, which is absolutely essential. Dr. Wotecki also served as the deputy undersecretary for the REE missionary uh, area uh, at USDA in the mid-90s. Prior to going to USDA, Dr. Wotecki served at the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy as the Deputy Associate Director for Science from 1994 to 1996. Dr. Wotecki has also held positions at the National Center for Health Statistics um, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Human Nutrition Information Service at USDA, and as director of the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine at the National Academies of Science. So that's very appropriate to be here today. In 1999, Dr. Wotecki was elected to the Institute of Medicine, uh, was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Sciences, Sciences where she chaired the Food and Nutrition Board. She received her MS and PhD in Human Nutrition from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, and she received her BS in biology and chemistry from Mary Washington University. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wotecki. everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and to see such a good turnout for this summit meeting, both in person and I understand there are people that are calling in as, as well. Um, it's been a long time in planning this. There have been a lot of people engaged in the stakeholder meeting uh, last fall and uh, as we're moving forward, after what I hope are going to be a real robust set of discussions during this summit meeting. Um, we're really going to be looking forward to working with all of you and the organizations that you represent in implementing a coordinated approach towards the uh, problem of uh, resistance to herbicides that is really challenging American agriculture. Cheryl, I really appreciate that warm introduction. And uh, as I said, I really appreciate the diversity of the interests that are represented in the registration for this meeting. We've had a lot of help in planning the summit meeting, uh, particularly the leadership of the Weed Science Society of America is greatly appreciated for uh, the uh, zeal with which they have been addressing this uh, problem and also the, the uh, eagerness with which they've approached the planning for this summit. Our own Office of uh, Pesticide Management Policy that uh, Cheryl directs, as well as APHIS, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, at USDA are sponsors of the meeting. And I think you should all take that as an indication 
of the uh, multiple agency commitment within the department to addressing this problem. There's not a more appropriate place to hold a summit meeting like this than here at the National Academy of Sciences. So we'd like to thank our, our hosts at, NIA, at NAS for, uh, for their sponsorship as well. Uh, and as you could hear from uh, Cheryl's brief description of some of the jobs I've held over the last few years, um, a, a major interest of mine has been in the application of science to inform our decision making uh, at the federal level uh, and also a, a, a really deeply held belief that science-based policies and science-based approaches are the ones that from a public policy perspective are going to be enduring and are going to be effective. So I appreciate your all participating in, in this summit. And uh, I think it goes without saying that the reason we're all here is we're all concerned about the emergence of uh, weeds that are resistant to pesticides. And we also recognize that this is really a complex problem. It's, it's not just a science problem, although there is a lot of science to inform our way forward. But it's, it's a complex interaction of agronomic as well as economic and sociological factors. Herbicide resistance confronts growers uh, and their advisors, uh, whether they're in the private sector or, or cooperative extension, with really a very complex set of decisions that have to be made for each individual operation about crop planting, harvesting, rotations, herbicides, tillage methods, and other weed management approaches. Agribusiness potentially ha is facing losses of markets because of product failures. And ultimately, um, consumers have concerns uh, about possibly facing limited supplies of commodities and associated price increases. So the pressures of managing resistant weeds uh, can also pose challenges and limit options in our conservation programs, triggering wider environmental impacts such as increased soil erosion and reduce water quality due to more nutrient runoff from tilt fields. So what we, in essence, have to do collectively is to conserve all of the tools that we have available for us for addressing weed management. So we here in the U.S. have increasingly um, been hearing through news media about the impact of herbicide-resistant weeds, particularly in cotton and soybean. Uh, but the problem is actually one that's uh, emerging around the world, and it's becoming more prevalent and more widespread both at home as well as around the world. So the issue is one that really can't be compartmentalized. It's not the problem of a single state in the U.S. or a single region within the U.S., but it's actually uh, a generic problem facing agriculture globally. In the big picture, um, over the longer term, this res uh, emergence of resistance to herbicides uh, can affect overall agricultural productivity. Uh, the potential for the growth of our markets, so e economic impacts at home, as well as the health of the environment, depending on the, uh, the interventions that are implemented to combat herbicide resistance. And during this century, Americans' producers have really been on the forefront uh, in meeting the global demands for food and for fiber, and also in pioneering methods for doing so in environmentally friendly ways. So that's why the state of our agricultural economy, our, our natural resources, uh, which are central to our ability to provide enough food fiber and bioproducts are part of Secretary Vilsack's cornerstones for revitalizing rural America. And that's why USDA is working for the success of American agriculture 
and why we also sponsored and helped to plan this summit meeting. We have multiple agencies within the department that are involved in addressing weed resistance to herbicides. Cheryl and uh, her group in the Office of Pest Management Policy are working hand in hand with colleagues in the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and within my own mission area, research, education, and economics, um, we have multiple agencies performing research that's helping to inform the way forward. These include the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, the Agricultural Research Service, and the Economic Research Service. And they also partner very effectively with APHIS, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. All of them are engaged in addressing herbicide-resistant weeds through research, in the application of research, in their programmatic decisions, in education, uh, particularly through cooperative extension, and our partners in the land-grant universities, and partnerships with other federal and state agencies, as well as a large number of groups in the scientific community and in the private sector. So because of the urgency of this issue, um, we here at this conference this week have a lot to do. The summit is really a call to action based on what we hope are going to be very candid discussions, uh, building on very candid discussions that were held during the stakeholder meeting last September. Our expectation is that each individual and the organizations that you represent are committed to doing your part, or our part in our case, in identifying workable solutions. And included it in those are ways that we can partner and work more effectively together to solve this problem of weed resistance to herbicide. The task is certainly challenging because all of the solutions vary uh, depending on the crop, the region of the country, but the future of American agriculture is going to depend on our ability to protect our crops and through them our livestock and ecosystems. So this issue is from our perspective at a very critical juncture in time. Compared with all of the other threats to agriculture, challenges to agriculture, um, weeds are causing the greatest loss of food, feed, and fiber and demand more of our money and time. Because weeds are wild populations and have a very diverse genetic uh, composition, our collective actions are going to play a pivotal role in how well we implement controls and when new weed resistance occurs. Evolved weed resistance to herbicides is not new, but the discovery of resistant to a very important uh, chemical, glyphosate, uh, more popularly referred to by the brand name Roundup over this past decade, has really kind of heightened the global concern as well as brought this problem of the emergence of resistance to, to herbicides into public awareness. The use of Roundup uh, is widespread, and, it, and it's been very important for weed control, not only in the major row crops, uh, but also across, across the landscape. These new cases of resistance have occurred along with the wide-scale adoption of genetically engineered crops with tolerance to Roundup. Grow growers found that they could use Roundup as their only means of weed control over vast acreages of soybean, cotton, and corn. And as a result, many moved away from what they had been using as a, a more diversified system of weed management and moved almost universally um, to a Roundup tolerant cropping system. And they actually had some very good reasons for doing so. Um, weed control uh, under this system is, is safe, it's flexible, it's simple, and it's also economical to the farmer. Uh, the Roundup system allowed growers to adopt no-till practices, which preserved soil and, and required less time. Um, one herbicide controlled practically all of the weed problems. 
The downside is the issue that we're facing today, and that is that this approach created strong selection pressure for the appearance of Roundup resistant weeds, and the system seemed to be working so well that some growers stopped scouting their fields, as had been their habit and their practice, uh, both before and after applying the herbicide. And Recent surveys by the National Agricultural Statistics Service have shown that the number of growers who scouted their fields dropped more than 70 percent in the year 2000 to about 40 percent in 2010. So this resulted in weeds that escaped control, they set seed, and then set the conditions for the problems that many farmers are facing today with herbicide resistant weeds in their fields. So we have to remember that herbicide resistance is not just about one chemical. Uh, it's not just about glyphosate. It can and does happen with a broad range of pesticides and herbicides. And many weed species evolved resistant to a wide variety of herbicides long before we became widely planted uh, with genetically engineered crops, resulting from a common use of herbicides in agriculture that had been our practice for, for many decades. So it's not a new concern for agriculture. It's not exclusively associated with genetically engineered crops. Any time an herbicide or an, any other weed control tactic is used continually, whether it's on a conventionally um, uh, uh, bred crop or a genetically engineered crop, it's going to put pressure on weeds to develop resistance. And that's why managing herbicide resistance is about an integrated program of weed management that involves a dynamic range of management tactics. Weed scientists all over the world are developing uh, new technical approaches uh, based on a more uh, fundamental understanding of, of the biology of weeds uh, and also evolving new technologies um, for management of weeds. And this has been an important part of the work that we have been doing and that we have been supporting in land-grant universities. And while this research base is important, um, the real solution is likely going to demand a much broader and more systematic and coordinated approach for the long-term sustainable management of weeds. So the research base is important, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to face into the challenges and actually get us to the situation where we're able to manage this problem. Growers are telling us much in their reasons for why they moved to the Roundup uh, 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 cropping approach. And in the same way that the economic and social factors that influence their choices to adopt this system, we also have to consider the economic and the social factors as well as the regulatory challenges that are going to influence our ability to have a widespread adoption across American agriculture of new technical solutions. We're going to need solutions as diverse as all of the groups and the interests that are represented in this audience today. And that's why I really am so pleased um, to see the breadth of the organizations that are represented uh, in the audience today. The stakeholders that met last September uh, identified a whole lot of challenges, and they also determined that adoption of integrated diverse management strategies is not going to happen without all of us working together collectively uh, across many disciplines and including new public-private partnerships. The presentations that we're going to be hearing today are going to address and, and identify some key action items that emerged from that stakeholder consultation in September. So please listen carefully 
um, suspend judgment while you're hearing the, the reports and, and the ideas, uh, and then participate in the discussion. Let your viewpoints be known. And uh, also, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to think about your role, whether it's a personal role that you can play, the role that your organization can play, and also the role that the sector that you represent as well can play in addressing this serious problem. We're certainly looking to this summit meeting as providing for us some very specific ways forward, and uh, we look to you to help us uh, in better understanding new ways that we might work together to tackle this burgeoning problem of herbicide resistance in weeds. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to be able to uh, be with you f till about 10.30 this morning, uh, but I am very much looking forward to uh, hearing the outcome and the results of the summit and uh, we'll be expecting uh, to hear from Cheryl and the team uh, what the specific actions are that uh, we are being looked to, to implement. I can assure you that we are committed to providing leadership within the department and within the government in addressing this issue. And uh, I have a couple of minutes, I think, when I could take some questions. <laughs>